And we've been talking about all kinds of different things from the aspects of the biblical perspective on romance and relationships. Uh, in this series, uh, man, we've been talking about a lot of different things. One, because I believe that this topic has been taboo for too long, especially when it comes to the church, because the Bible has so much to say about it. And so as a church, I, I think sometimes we're quiet about these things because they could be awkward. But I believe God's Word talks a lot about these things when it comes to romance and relationship. So we've been cracking it open. We've been having fun. Uh, week one, man, we had a great time talking about all things when it comes to sex. Week two, we had a great conversation when it comes to singleness. Um, and and, and we, the, the, one of the thoughts that we kind of left you with last week was this, is that we don't need to wait on anyone else to step into God's calling in our life right now. And so it doesn't matter what, where you're at in your relationship, you can know that God has a purpose for you right now. But week three, we're talking about dating. And in every, seri in every uh, step of the series so far, I I'll share some fun statistics just to kind of get us going. And so I've got some for you today. In fact, these are my favorite ones so far. First one out of the, out of the gate is this. 93% <clears throat> of women prefer to be asked out on a date. Here's the, here's the fun part. But 26% of men prefer to be asked out. So there's a quarter of the men looking to date are sitting on G, waiting on O, not doing a thing, waiting on the girl. But then there's 93% of women that are waiting for men. What that tells us is there's a gap right here of people that are never going to connect because she's waiting on him and he's waiting on her. So guys, this is free. It's not even in your notes. Ask. All right, so keep moving. 57% of women and 51% of men said they're almost certain that the current relationship they're in is permanent. So about half, a little over half the people who are dating, right now they think that that relationship is going to become marriage. That relationship is going to become permanent. It's an interesting statistic. Uh, so let's keep going. 85% of women think, think that men who dress well are more attractive than men with money. So this is, guys, right now, this will tell you something. You know, you think, I got to get a job, I got to save up, I got to have a nice car. Man, maybe just like get some jeans that fit and brush your hair, maybe go to a barber and, and put on some deodorant. This may be a good thing. In fact, I didn't put this, but 87% uh, of women said that smell is one of the key factors, whether they decide to say yes on the first date. So what you wear and how you smell is a big deal, guys. All right, that's free. Um, that's not in my notes or in the Bible. That's just free. 45% of women find men who play guitar attractive. Come on now. That is how I got my wife. I'm telling you, I'm not a very good guitar player, but I played, and that was the, that was the deal breaker. Brad, did that work for you? Yeah, it worked for Brad, too. So Levi, how about you? That worked for you? Yeah, so Levi worked for him. I mean, so we're three for three. So if there are any single guys, I can tell you what you need to do. Go get some jeans that fit, take a shower, and buy a guitar, and you're done. It's a done deal. And then ask, all right? So let's keep going. 91% um, of women say, and I would disagree with this, I think this is wrong, prefer a clean-shaven guys. Come on, boo. Everyone say boo. Yeah. I'm a bearded guy. I have to think that at least you like my beard, don't you? I shaved my beard once a couple years ago, and it was not a good day in the Morris house. She said, when you kiss me, it's all prickly. So I was like, I'll fix that. And then she was like, don't do that either. So now we're kind of in this weird limbo. Um, yeah, so uh, when it comes to dating, there's a lot of different things. In fact, uh, this statistic's not up there today, but right now there's 110 million people on dating apps in the U.S. alone. I mean, so dating is a big deal. Um, in fact, uh, another statistic I saw said that 97% of women said they'll swipe right if the guy's attractive, but then it was, I think it was 68 or 69% of men said they swipe right if the woman's attractive. So like attraction, how things look, that, that like judge a book by its cover, People are engaging, maybe not personally, but, but uh, digitally first. In fact, the last few weddings that I've done, all of them they've met on, went on Tinder. And so literally the last three weddings I've done, all three of them they met on Tinder. And so like dating scene is changing and it's, it's different now. Like I remember like before, like when I first started dating Stephanie, like you couldn't make phone calls at home and, and without it costing you. So you had to call people like after 9 p.m. Anyone remember that? like the after 9 p.m. phone calls, and then if you sent text messages, it charged you per text. And so, like, so when I was dating Stephanie, when, when I was pursuing her, like, I had to actually call her or go to her and sit across from her. It's a little bit different than today where you can swipe and text and, and, and do all kinds of different things. 
So obviously dating is shifting and changing. And it's funny because I've actually had a few people say, does the Bible even talk about dating? And it, to be honest with you, it doesn't talk about dating specifically, but it talks a lot about becoming and finding the right person and having the right people in your life. There's not a scenario in the New Testament where Jesus sits down with Peter and, and says, uh, you know, or, or, or Paul sits down with Timothy, Timothy and says, hey, you're a young preacher. Let me roll this out. This is how you should ask her. This is where you should ask her. This is the restaurant you should go to. It's around the corner there at the Sea of Galilee. Like, that's not, you're not going to find that in the New Testament. Uh, but what you're going to find is a lot of God's word that talks about having the right kind of people in your life. Um, and, and, and I believe that those same principles when it comes to friends, when it comes to marriage, when it comes to, to advisors or counsel, any of that kind of stuff, a lot of that lays directly over our dating relationships. And so in the series, we've been doing two things. One, we've been looking at a myth. What is, what's a myth? Maybe something that we've believed that maybe not be true when it comes to God's word. So what's the myth and what's the truth? So here's our first myth for you uh, this morning. Myth is this, is that God has some one, one in all caps there, for me. There's God has some one for me. Many of us are hopeful for that moment, like that in singles in the room. You're hopeful for that moment when you like are sitting maybe at a restaurant or something like that, and you see that highly attractive person of the opposite sex sitting across the room, and they're talking and they're having fun with their friends, and the, the song is playing in the background, and you're talking and you're having fun with your friends, but they're talking, you can't even hear them because you're just staring at them, and they're talking, but you can't hear them because there's just a song and the ambience in the background, and they kind of laugh in slow motion and their eyes cut and your eyes cut, and you lock eyes, and it's done, right? It's just like the next thing you know, you're making out in the bathroom. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that's how all the movies portray it, right? That's the, that's the very next thing. Like, we, we caught eyes, now it's, it's on. You know, and so, you know, I, I think some of us are maybe dreaming, maybe not for a moment exactly like that, but a moment like that, where there's like this undeniable feeling, there's this undeniable attraction that that's the one person for me. Uh, in fact, I can remember the first time I met Stephanie, um, I was working at a clothing store in the mall uh, called The Buckle, um, and, and uh, it, was, it was fun. You can see me working there, right? Yeah. Um, did anyone ever try to run to the back of the store and touch it without someone saying something to you? Yeah. It's a commission-based store, so it's kind of crazy. Anyway, she comes rolling in with a couple friends, and I think they're on a scavenger hunt or something for a birthday party, and I just saw this brunette with ringlet curly hair that was short and petite. And I was like, that girl is beautiful. And so they're walking around with their friends. And somehow we ended up talking. And we ended up exchanging email addresses, um, which led to me getting her AIM address. Anyone remember AOL Instant Messenger? Anyone ever used to do that? And so that was before texting. And so I got her AIM address. And so we started text like aiming, I don't know what you call it then, messaging, whatever, back and forth and talking and something like that. And it, it was amazing like because it was almost as if that thing in the movies happened with us. And it's like almost as if like the first time I saw her, I was like, that's it. That's, the, that's what I've been looking for. That's what I was hoping for. But I, I know this, that even though that sounds amazing and it was amazing, and I'm so thankful that God brought you into my life in that moment. I'm thankful I was working at the buckle even though it wasn't the funnest job, and because I met you, um, and they had a good food court in the mall, too. That was kind of nice, too, um, but, you know, so, so I, I look at all those things, but what would happen if she came in and was as attractive as she is, and I was, I was, you know, just totally fascinated with her, but what if she didn't love God? Like, so is that not the one? Uh, it, it, all of a sudden, is that, that moment, that instant attraction, that, that, the butterflies in the stomach, the pit in, the, in my stomach, like all of a sudden, is that different? Well, no, I, I, know, and I know this, that there's a reality that I could have messed this up. There's a reality that she could have messed it up. There's a reality that, and I know that because we're married now and we mess up stuff all the time, <laughs> that we're constantly working on a relationship and we're constantly trying to be the right person towards God, the right person towards each other, and the right person towards our kids and our family and friends, stuff like that. So it's not that there was like this instantaneous perfection, like, like God just aligned all the stars. I can tell you if I would have messed it up, I, I wanted to be married. I'd probably be married today. I, I'm so glad I didn't mess it up because I think she's the one for me. I love you. I'm glad you're here. But if I would have, I, I, I can tell you I'd probably, I could probably still get married. And same thing with you. You can maybe look at your life and go, well, I messed up that relationship there. Maybe I wasn't quite ready, or maybe I, I, I was immature and they were much, more mature, or maybe it's the other way around. And so maybe sometimes we kind of feel like maybe I lost that moment, like that was the person and I blew it. And I, I just want to tell you right out, right out of the gates that I think that God has someone for you, but I don't know that it's someone. 
because there's moments in our lives that we're broken and we break things. And then there's moments in life when we get together and we make a commitment and we still break things. And we still got to process through it. And so just because she was the one for me and I'm madly in love with her doesn't mean that I still don't break things from time to time. And, and so I, I think this is a myth. I don't know that there's just this one singular person for you. And I, I think this, that some of us think this way. We think that once you meet the right person, everything's going to be all right. Like there's some things in my life I want to get better, some things in my life I need to fix. But once I find that person, it's all going to kind of settle in. We're going to kind of fit into a groove. And I think it's a couple of those things about my personality I really need to work on. Like once I find the right person, they're going to be the perfect puzzle piece. And we're going to fit together. And I won't even have to work on them because she's just going to round me out. It's going to be good. And I kind of feel like maybe some of us, we talked about this last week in the singles message, some of us are waiting and we're looking for that right person. And too often we place our fulfillment or purpose in the right person. And that's too much pressure. I'll tell you right, this right out of the gates. When you're dating or looking today, it's too much pressure to put on any one person for them to complete you. I think about the, the, the old Tom Cruise, Jerry Maguire, you complete me. Remember that? Uh, that was a cheesy movie. No one remember that? Anyone watch that? Jerry Maguire? Am I the only one? I'm dating myself with AIM and Jerry Maguire and all this stuff. But he like, it was a famous scene. In fact, there's gifs about it and memes about it. You complete me. And I think that's too much pressure to put on any person. I think it's too much pressure to put on the person you love, the person you care, to put on your spouse, is that it's their responsibility to fill the gaps in your soul. It's their responsibility to make you all right. So what's the truth? I believe this is the truth, is that God is calling you to be the one. That God's calling you to be, were you looking for someone to complete you? I think what God's calling you to do is to step up and be the person he's called you to be. Uh, 1 John 2, 6 says this, whoever says, 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 <laughs> whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. So whoever says he has a relationship with God, whoever says that he's got a connection, he's intimate, he's, he's had a relationship with God, whoever says that, they ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. And I believe the first step that we need to take in dating is not towards someone that we're attracted to, but towards God. At the very first step when it comes to dating, the very first step into pursuing a relationship, even married people, the very first step that we need to take to repairing our marriage or, or getting over a hump or maybe having some, some breakthrough in an area is not to work here, but it's to work here. That, that if we start working on this, if we start bettering this, if we start following Jesus better, if we start loving God better, if we start knowing God better, I promise you that, has a, that vertical pursuit has a horizontal effect. And too many times I think we're pursuing here and we're not working on this and we just keep hitting, like we just keep hitting a comma in our story. Like, I wish I was more like this, maybe tomorrow. I, I wish I could do more of this. Maybe once I meet the right person, I can do that. And it's a comma, it's a comma, it's a comma. It's the, like the never ending run on sentence. And God's saying, I've got a, a finite work I wanna do in you. I got something I wanna do in you today that's gonna change everything, but you gotta go here before you go there. And I, I think that's what the scripture's telling us. I think that applies to our, our dating and our relationships. Andy Stanley says this. He says, become the kind of person, the person you are looking for, is looking for. Did you catch that? This is brilliant. Become the kind of person that the person you're looking for is looking for. I think that's the truth. That's what God is calling us to do. Instead of looking to other people to complete us, why don't we work on ourselves? Why don't we pursue Jesus ourselves? Be who God's called us to be. And the problem is while we're off busy looking, we aren't becoming. As long as we're looking, we're not becoming. As long as we're pursuing, we're not becoming. And then what happens is if we're not becoming who God's called us to be, if we're completely consumed with looking for someone else to complete us, as opposed to becoming who God's called us to be, the problem is we risk finding the right person, but we're not the right person. Like if you're looking for that special someone and you set your goals up here and you're like, this is the person, but all I'm doing is consumed with looking instead of becoming, maybe I, someday my path crosses that person, but I'm not ready. Because all I've been doing is looking, looking, looking instead of becoming, becoming, becoming. Now, I'm not telling you not to look, but I think there's a balance in these two things. So when you, don't, when you, when you know who you are, here's, here's the truth. I believe this. When you know who you are, you won't fall for who you aren't. So if you're becoming who God's called you to be, you're not going to end up falling for someone or, or having a relationship with someone that's not going to help you move forward and achieve your goals and be the person God's called you to be. Become the kind of person, the person you are looking for is looking for. So what's the next myth? Next myth is this. As soon as you're content, God will send someone. 
Man, I heard this all the time in, in church, talking to singles and young adults. Like, the reason you can't find anyone is because you're not content with where you are. Like, as soon as you become content, once you become happy with where you are, God's just got, he's just, God's basically, what they're saying is God is holding back on you. And that, man, when I read scripture, that's not the God that I see. I don't see a God who's holding back good gifts from his kids, saying, I want to give you something, but you haven't, met, you haven't met up to my expectations yet. If that was true, then none of us would be saved. If that was true, then Jesus would have never died on the cross for our sins, for our salvation, because we would have never done enough good things to deserve it. No, but God, because of his love, because, of his, 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 because he's rich in mercy, he gives good gifts to his people. But I think this, this, this myth is that once you're content, once you're good enough, once you've got enough things right, then God will send the right person into your life. And I can tell you this as a broken married man, that's, I'm glad that wasn't true because she married a guy that was a little bit messed up and still a little bit messed up. I'm, I'm thankful you stick with me. Like, and any married people in the room, you could attest to that. Like when you got married, you weren't right. You might have been the right person for them in that season, but you weren't right. You still got work to do. And if any of us are really honest, we'd say, I'm still got work to do. I'm still in process with this. So being right or being content, God's not waiting for you to do that. Um, so what, what, what does this mean? Let me look at this. Genesis 2 says this. Then the Lord said, God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I'll make a helper for him who is just right for him. See, I, I think it's God's intention for you to have someone. I think it's God's intention for you to have people in your life that you love and you trust and you can, be, you can share your life with and be intimate with. In fact, singles, I don't think there's anything wrong with desiring to be married. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. In fact, I think it's good to know what you want. I, in fact, I, good, I think it's good to know that because I think God wired us this way. I think God wired us to want to be in relationship with people. And in fact, last week we talked about this. We said, you know, one of the greatest myths for singles is that you're alone. You're not alone. God has people for you. Even if you're in a season where you're not married or not dating, that doesn't mean you're alone in your journey. That there's a church, there's people, there's community that God wants you to be in partnership with you. It is not good for man to be alone. He didn't say it's not good for Adam to not have Eve. This is a general statement for all mankind. God wired you to be in relationship with other people. So I think it's perfectly okay to want to be married. I think it's perfectly okay to desire to have relationship with people. God's not waiting for you to be content, to, then he can give you what, what, he's wanting, what he's wanting to give you. So what's the, tr what's the truth then? Here's the truth. Content doesn't mean complacent. Content doesn't mean complacent. I believe you can be grateful for where you are, content, but also be striving for what's ahead, not complacent. Did you catch that? I believe you can be grateful for where you're at right now, God, thank you for what you've done in my life. God, thank you that you've brought me here. God, thank you that, that I have these friends. God, thank you for this church. God, thank you for my friends. God, thank you that you love me. God, thank you for the people that you put in my life. God, thank you for my job. God, thank you for your provision. Thank you for the school. Thank you for whatever it is. I think we can be grateful. That's what the word content means, but it doesn't mean we have to be complacent. It doesn't mean we have to sit there and go, well, I guess nothing's ever gonna happen. I'm just gonna sit here and wait uh, you know, in fact, I think it's, 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 it's going to be hard to find someone else to spend the rest of your life with if you're not looking, if you're not out there pursuing people, if you're not out there desiring that. So I think the best way to find the right kind of person is to make sure that you're looking in the right kind of places. The best way to find the right, so if, you, if you're content but not complacent, let's say you're looking, you're, any singles, I'm not going to make you raise your hand, but if I did, I would say just try and look to the left and look to the right and then maybe here today. Um, you know, and so maybe you are looking. I, I'm, I'm being facetious, but I'm being kind of serious too. Maybe you're looking. Maybe the right, maybe the finding the right person is, is about looking in the right places. Um, so next myth. I'm kind of moving through some of these because I want to give you some dating tips here at the end. Myth number three, dating is for relational recreation. Dating is for re relational, relational recreation. In the first week of our series, we talked about dualism and talked about that when it pertains to our sex and sexuality, meaning this, that we, dualism meaning that I believe that, um, is a dualistic thought, is believing that what I do with my body is separate from my soul and that what I want to do with my body, fulfilling my, my desires or fulfillments, whatever I may be pursuing in that way, does not going to affect my soul. Those things are separate. It's recreational. And so if you, if you miss that and, ch and challenge, you go back and watch week one, we kind of broke that down. Those things are not, in fact, those things are tied together. 
And, and so dating, what that tells us is dating is, is not for recreational uh, relationships. Dating leads to intimacy. It, it does. Our problem is that we see, I think, our society is that we see dating as a status. Like, think about this. I think a lot of people, when they talk about dating, it's less about, like, the process of getting to know someone. It's less about the process of getting to, like, maybe meet their parents or have a, a deeper relationship or maybe that person drawing you closer to God or you drawing them closer to God or maybe what you talked about from the sermon. I think more often than not, it's a label. It's I'm dating. And I think the problem with that is that it puts it kind of in this recreational side, sidebar where we're looking at like I'm dating or I'm seeing someone or we're talking. Have you ever heard those phrases? I mean, me and us have probably said those phrases. And what we're doing is we're putting a status on something that's not a status, it's actually a process. Dating is not a status. It's not, it's not, like, it's not my relational status update for Facebook. It's, it's a process. It's, it, it leads to something. It leads to intimacy. So what happens is even casual dating it, it yields itself to engaging in some types of intimacy, whether it's relational, emotional, physical, spiritual, whatever. I could prove it to you this way. If you've ever been on a date and you walk someone to the door to say goodnight, I almost just started doing the DC talk rap there. Anyone know the DC talk rap? <laughs> Walked into the door to say, kiss or say goodnight. No one know that? Okay. I always, like almost every Sunday, I'm trying not to rap for you guys. So one of these Sundays, <laughs> one of these Sundays I'm going to bust out a rap for you. Um, an early 90s Fresh Prince of Bel-Air style rap. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so you ever walk someone to the door to say goodnight? She said, I have an apple. Would you care to take a bite? But like, I refused. I'm looking for a lady. She said, she slapped me in the face and said, boy, you must be crazy. <laughs> that's not a poem. That's part of the rap. Um, but you get to that place and you're at, you're at the door and you're, you're getting ready to say goodnight. And like, if you ever like tried to like just pat him on the head and say, that was fun. You know, like a dog, you know, like, hey, it was nice to, nice to hang out. Like, you were, you were nice. You know, thank you for buying my dinner. Or, or maybe just fist bump. Have you ever tried that? Like, hey, man, I had a great, incredible time. Man, you're beautiful. Thank you so much for spending the night with me and hang out. Here you go. Give me one of those. Like, it just doesn't work. Why doesn't it work? Because in that moment, that's a place for a transaction of intimacy. That's why it doesn't work. And so what happens when we date, whether we think it's just for recreation, whether we think it's just a status, it's just something I'm doing to pass the time, I'm bored, all my guy friends are dating, or all my girlfriends are dating, and I might as well go on a date or two with someone. We think it's just this thing that you can do, but it's not, because it's going gonna, it's gonna to bring you to a crossroads, a crossroads of where you're going to have to face, am I going to take the step of intimacy or am I not? You think just the door, being at the door and saying goodnight, that's really simple. But what about emotionally? What about, what if you do kind of have some connection with them? And so you start talking every day, multiple times a day. Or what if she leaves you a note on your car while you're at school and you walk out and it's a sweet note. And then now you're going, man, I was, had no intention of really going out very long with this girl. And now she's leaving me notes. And now all of a sudden you're in this pickle. Or then all of a sudden you find yourself now getting physical and you're like, well, that's fun, but I, I don't really like her. The way she chews drives me insane. I, I want to punch her in her face when she eats. And, <laughs> but it was fun making out, so let's see where this goes. I mean, I, you're, it's, it is funny. I'm, I'm making fun of it. But like, the reality is we've all been in those type of situations. If you've dated, you've got yourself in a relationship emotionally or physically or, or maybe even spiritually, you moved the ball down the court and you weren't even quite sure yet because dating was a status and not a process. You weren't necessarily looking to find that special someone. You were just looking for, to find someone to pass the time. Uh, Mike Todd says this. I think it's a great quote. Dating is a vehicle, not a destination. So dating is not the place that we stop. In fact, it's, it's something that takes us somewhere. And, and we got to have the right perspective of dating. Recreational dating, I think, is dangerous. I think it, it ends, often ends in hurt, regret, and shame. You look back and you go, I wish I wouldn't have done that. You look back and say, man, that was really hard. You look back and, and maybe it takes you months or maybe years to get past that moment or that relationship. So what's the truth? If dating is not for recreational relationship, here's the truth. Dating is for marriage evaluation. This is the truth. This is what dating is for. This is the purpose of dating. Dating is for marriage evaluation. So, John, are you saying that I shouldn't date until I'm looking for a spouse? Yep. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm saying. Hang out with your friends. Hang out with groups of people. But dating is, is a vehicle that's taking us somewhere. 
It's a vehicle that's taking us to intimacy, and that intimacy is reserved for marriage according to God's word in Genesis chapter 2. So if we believe God's word, if we believe Genesis chapter 2, then that means dating has a, it's a process. It's taking us somewhere. Dating is for marriage evaluation. So this, this is a challenge for you guys just this morning. I think you should wait to date until you're ready to marry. Uh, don't, like, I've had someone ask me before, like, my kid's 15 or 16, should I let them go on a date? My, my response is, like, how many people are going to be there? It's like, 10? Sure. It'll be fun. It'll be awkward. They'll get some of those weird conversations out of the way. If it's just them and they, like, my son and, my, and a girl, drop them off the movies? Nope. Not happening. How many friends does he want to invite? Invite a few. I'm down with that. It's just not necessary. It, it, because they're not, with it, dating is a vehicle that takes us into intimacy. It's a transportation to intimacy, and a 15-year-old doesn't know how to handle that. And, and so you're like, man, I'd hate to be your kid. Yeah, you probably would. <laughs> but here's what I know is I want my kid to be able to walk into those relationships and offer the best of what they have in that relationship, not what's left over from broken pieces from years of trying or playing with it or engaging with it when they weren't quite ready for it. So save yourself the pain of loving incorrectly. Save yourself the pain of loving incorrectly and wait to date until you're ready to get married. Does that mean you have to know that you're going to marry the person to date them? No, that's part of the process. That's part of the process of dating someone. It's part of the process of getting to know them. If you wait until till you know that they're the one before you start dating, the chances are they're going to be engaged to someone else because they're a good pick. Like someone's out there and goes, hey, I like that. that that's a good person. So you got to get out there. You got to date. You got to engage in those things. So what qualities should I be looking for? I think this is, like the, this is what everyone's looking for today. If you're taking notes, if you're dating, this is, this is good. What qualities should you be looking for in married people? I, I, t- I challenge you in this. What qual- qualities should you be looking for? This is not what you should be looking for because you've already found what you've been looking for. Maybe a reframing for you is what qualities should I be trying to produce? What qualities should I be leading? What qualities should I be becoming? Okay? So here, here's the problem. I think a lot of us, though, we make a list, right? We make a list of like, I want to be tall, I want to be dark, I want to be handsome, I want them to have abs, but not like chiseled, almost dad bodish abs. Um, that just so all the rest of us can fit into the category. Um, you know, I want this, I want that. And here's the problem when we, when we make a list. The problem when we make the list is this, is that you are not an assembly of features. When we start making lists, is what we do is I want them to look like this, I want them to talk like this, I want them to have this kind of family drive this kind of car. I mean, I've seen some people's lists. They're like 80 things long. And so now what they're doing is almost like, like, they're, like it's like the Barbie. It's like they're going in like, I want a little more of this, shape it a little more like this. And when all of a sudden we start looking, and this is what happens to society, is that this is how we choose people that we date oftentimes. So as a society, we start genetically and physically adjusting ourselves to fit other people's lists. I mean, you see, this happens right now today. You think the list isn't a big deal, it's just something fun people do? No, it's not. It, it, the, the list affects people. Well, all these lists that we see in magazines and Men's Health and Cosmopolitan and, you know, here's eight things that women are looking for, here's 24 things that guys are looking for, and they're, they're shaping a list which is turning us into an assembly of features. And so when people don't meet that criteria, they go and they start adjusting themselves to try to fit. They develop eating disorders and all kinds of different things to try to make themselves fit into certain categories. And that's not who God made you to be. We talked about that a little bit last week. Why is this important? Because you're a real person. God made you exactly who you are. He, and we talked about this last week. I encourage you to go back and listen. But you are handcrafted by God. God loves you how you are. He may have a future plan and hope and desire for you, but right now, how you are today, he's not waiting for you to change something, not waiting for you to lose a few pounds, not waiting for you to get a haircut, not waiting for you to do this or to do that or pay off that debt. God loves you right now how you are. And the people that you're looking at and the people that, that should be looking at you should have that same kind of love inside of them. And when I met Stephanie, I'm so glad that she didn't hold me accountable to the person I kept saying I wanted to be, that she loved me for who I was in that moment. And I, because what that did is that gave me the grace to grow. It gave me the grace to become that person. So Proverbs 31, 30 says this, Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. So if we marry just on attraction, if we're dating just on attraction, then what will you divorce for? So if our dating relationship is just attraction first, if that's it, then what are the things that will cause us to, to maybe grow out of love with that person? Attraction is important. Like, I'm not saying it's not important. But remember this, everyone, gravity always wins. 
It always wins. It, it does. And in time and space and seasons, they happen. You can't stop them. They, things move forward. So our marriages, our dating relationships have to be deeper than just attraction. So what's the order of evaluation? I want to give you guys an order of evaluation that I think as a Christian, as a believer, these are the things in order that you should be looking for when you're looking for someone to date. Is this. One, are they a Christian? Two, what's their character like? Three, how do I get along with them relationally, friendship-wise, companionship? And then four, what's my attractional chemistry? If you notice, and if you, if you consider, this is probably the exact opposite list of what the world is, is pumping out. It's probably, it, it's probably flipped, exactly, where attraction is number one. Companionship is number two. Do we have a connection? Their character is number three, and then their faith is the last thing. And, and, and I think it's important that, that this is number one, and here's why. 2 Corinthians 6.14 says this, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. A yoke, if you've ever seen it, two oxen, two, two big animals that, that pull and plow a field. They, they have to walk in rhythm and in step. And the way they do that is they have a big wooden yoke that has like two big humps on it. And they, they lock their heads in with both feet down. And they can drive ahead and they can pull and they can plow and they can, they can prepare a harvest. And so what, what, what Paul is saying here is don't be unequally yoked. Don't get into a covenant committed relationship with someone who believes different than you. Number one, they got to be a Christian. That's got to be right out of the gate. So here's, here's a list of things I'm going to give you today. What should you look for in a future spouse? One, they got to be saved. I, I think that's right out of the gate. As a believer, that's got to be top on your list. That's got to be the awkward, like, um, you know, get that conversation going. Uh, hopefully they put it in their Instagram profile, makes it easy for you. You know, like, I love Jesus and a scripture and some flowers and maybe their sorority. And then you're like, hey, okay, got that, got that question out of the way. Okay, so now what's next? I got some more stuff for you. Matthew 6, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Seek first. You're looking for someone to seek God first. There's a difference in being saved, and then there's a difference in pursuing God. So what should you look for in a future spouse in dating? Someone that's pursuing God. Not just someone who's prayed a prayer sometime at church camp a couple years ago, but someone who opens their Bible daily. Someone who listens to worship music, who spends time praying, maybe before a test or before a meal or at the beginning or end of their day. You want to look for someone who's pursuing God. So let's keep going. Proverbs 25, 24 says this. It's better to live alone in the corner of an attic, <laughs> painting a picture here, than with a quarrelsome wife in a lovely home. It's better to live alone in the corner of an attic than a, a quarrelsome wife in a lovely home. Here's something I want you to see in all these scriptures I'm showing you. You're like, are these about dating? No, they're not necessarily about dating, but how helpful is this advice if you're already married? How, how helpful is this if you're already married? Now you're stuck. You're like, I guess I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish that attic out, make it look real nice, put a TV up there. I've got a neighbor who's got a giant TV in his garage, and he lives there. And I can promise you, it probably has something to do with this conversation right here. I'm not saying he didn't play a part, but I've, you've seen the guys with the man caves. There's a, there's a reason a lot of times for that, both, both sides. So this is helpful. Um, so 28, verse 28 says this, a person without self-control is like a city broke with broken down walls. Girls, if guys have anger issues, if, they've got, if, they, if they lose their temper in something stupid like playing pickleball um, or watching a football game on TV and they do something physical or, or aggressive, I gotta tell you something right there. That, these, these are people maybe not pursuing God that, that the works of the fruit of the spirit are not alive in their lives. And so is it, how helpful is this once you're married? Not a lot of helpful. Now you've got to pray and ask God for grace and patience to help them grow and to help me grow and to help me play my part. But beforehand, this helps me a lot. This is good. All right, so what is, what's the truth with this or what are we looking for in this? We're looking for people with self-control on both sides, guys and girls. We need people with self-control, people that can tell themselves no to the things, the flesh that drives them to do things, whether it's anger or bitterness or gossip or whatever it may be. So let's keep going. 1 Corinthians 13 says this, Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Man, that, that verse 6, that love does not rejoice at wrongdoing. How much time do we spend on social media laughing at other people failing and, and making fun of and looking at politicians and other people and wishing ill upon them? That's not love. 
It says, but they rejoice in the truth. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. This is the picture of love. So what are we looking for? We're looking for someone with permeating love. That love is coming out of them in, in every way, in every capacity. That when they encounter new people, that, that there's love and grace. When they see someone that's hurting, that their first response is not to judge or criticize or be critical, but love and grace. That when they see someone win, their first res- response is not to be bitter, like, why didn't that happen to me? Or I bet they, they, they lucked into that, but to celebrate other people's wins. We're looking for people that have permeating love. Romans 13 says this, 13 through 14, this is the Passion Translation. It says, we must live honorably surrounded by the light of this new day, not in darkness of drunkenness or debauchery, not in promiscuity or sensuality, not being argumentative or jealous of others. Instead, fully immerse yourselves in the Lord Jesus, the anointed one. Don't waste even a moment thought on your former identity to awaken in selfish desires. So the last thought for you today is this. What you should be looking for is people who put a priority on purity in all areas of their lives. Whether it comes to their sexuality, whether it comes to how they treat you when it comes to physical whether it's uh, what they do with their, in their thoughts, in their music, in their movies, in their minds. You want to find people who have a, have a priority on purity, that they recognize that they've got something worth guarding, which is their heart. Um, because if they don't guard theirs, I can promise you this, they won't guard yours. And I think too many Christians, they feel like when they start dating, is they think too highly of their ability to have self-control when it comes to the issues in the areas of purity. They think, well, I'm a good Christian, and I pray, and I read my Bible, and I was at worship, and I served, and, and I give, so, you know, I, I can keep things under control. I can keep things under wrap. They, they think too highly of their own abilities, and so you need to, be, need to be looking for someone who's got a priority on purity. I'll tell you this. When it comes to dating, I think this is a, is a profound truth, is that you should pre-decide with the person that you're dating what honoring looks, look, looks like with your body, with what honoring God looks like when it comes to your body. Predecide, have a conversation. Hey, we're dating. We're making a commitment. This is a process that we're choosing that's going to take us to intimacy. So what's the line? Where, where are we setting the boundaries? How, how are we going to protect ourselves in this area? Remember the, the quote by Andy Stanley says this. Become the kind of person the person you're looking for is looking for. So whether you're dating or looking or whether you're married, I'll, I'll tell you this today, that all of us have room to grow. Um, if you're looking for the right person, Man, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a hard place to come from because I can promise you this, you may not be the right person. So our primary focus has to be becoming who God's called us to be. Uh, guys, I'm not telling you don't look. I'm not telling you not to date. I'm not telling you not to ask. I'm just saying make sure you're first. Seek first the kingdom of God. Make, make a priority, have a relationship with God. You do that and you, you, you do things right this way, then I promise you when you start pursuing relationships this way, things have a lot better possibility of working out. And now, uh, uh, just kind of one last thought, this is in my notes, but if you are da- dating someone and it's not good, it's not a relationship, man, I think part of being someone of honor is, is saying things even when it hurts, it is approaching things even if it's not fun. So don't continue to, to be involved in a relationship that's causing you pain. If you're dating someone or if you know you're, maybe you're crossing some lines when it comes to this stuff, man, don't, don't think I'm going to deal with this or we're going to curb this. Be, be up front with them. Be a person of honor that can sit down, look someone across the eye and say, look, I've made some mistakes and here's my line. Um, I think that's part of being a great person and pursuing Jesus in those words. So I'll tell you this, just kind of in, in, in closing here today, that when it comes to dating, I, I think more often than not, most of us have made plenty of mistakes. But I promise you this, your best days are ahead of you. That what the same Jesus that died on the cross to wash you of your sins when before you were saved, that grace that was there before you were saved that you received in that moment, that same grace is here for you today. And so if you look at your life and maybe you're looking back with some regrets or some shame, maybe you're looking back and say, I mean, I could have done things better. Maybe I shouldn't have dated that person. Maybe I shouldn't have done that thing. I'll tell you this, the same grace that was there the day that you prayed and you asked God to be the Lord of your life is here for you today.